In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. If we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9 verse 14. Matthew chapter 9 verse 14. Then John's disciples came and asked, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't fast? You see, our Lord Jesus Christ never made a legalistic command for them to fast. Oh, he would teach them uh, pretty much all the time, but he also made sure that since he was under his authority and under his direction, that they were always fed. And they always had the meals that they needed to have. And they never needed to fast. And yet John's disciples come and ask this question. And they come and ask this question because they think there's some spiritual value in not eating. They think there is some spiritual value in self-sacrifice. And the concept of fasting, as we've noted, comes from the fact that they fasted because they were too busy listening to the Word of God than to eat. And a lot of times in those, in those days, they would go on and listen to the Word of God five and six hours, and people would start to get hungry around lunchtime. They might start learning the Word of God in the morning, and then uh, the teaching goes on and on, and then by lunchtime, they start to get hungry. But instead of eat, the pastor, or who would, they didn't have pastors then, but the person in authority would keep teaching, and they would keep listening, and they might miss a meal and then have to make up for it later. And that was the idea of fasting. But their idea of fasting was, we don't eat out of sacrifice. And they might not have even been learning anything. And they might have just been uh, not eating. And they say, well, we won't eat for the next three days. And they would make that pact with themselves. And they wouldn't, and they would get extremely hungry. And they would think to themselves, I'm so holy, and I'm so great because I do not eat. Well, it's self-righteousness. It's a worthless type of thing that they were doing. And so then Jesus asked them a question. You see, they start off with a question. And Jesus Christ was, of course, a genius, a spiritual genius, definitely, of course. And so when uh, someone asked him a question, well, he would, turn right, he would turn it right around and ask them a question. And they had a fallacious question. How come you and your disciples don't fast? They always saw Jesus and the disciples eating. And they did fast sometimes. And sometimes he would be up on the mountain teaching and the disciples would get really hungry and say, Lord, when are we going to eat? And then he would say, you want to eat right now? All right. And then he would uh, turn a few fish into 5,000 and a few loaves of bread into 5,000 and make them distribute them. And then they would have to act like a waiter for the next couple of hours until everyone could be fed. But that fasting was true fasting. They were learning the Word of God. But in this case, they were fasting thinking there was some spiritual significance behind it. And there are some idiots even today who think that they must fast. I've run across them. I don't know if you've ever run across them, but I definitely have run across them. And that's because in my family, we have a lot of legalists. My family is loaded down with legalists. And they always talk about, I've had them come down on their vacations. And for some reason, they always come to visit us. And I don't know why, but they do. And they come all the way down from whence they came. And I wish they would stay, but they come down. And we have to be polite, of course. And we can't be uh, mean and say, get out of here, you freaks. If we could, I would. 
but instead we have to show impersonal love and offer them all the comforts that uh, all of us have. And so they come in and then they uh, get very self-righteous and start talking. Yes, I, uh, I fasted last week for about uh, three days. As if we really care what they did last week for three days, but they think it's holy. And they think that because they deprive themselves from food, they're doing something great. And I've been exposed to people like that, uh, but they just don't understand that they live in a new age. And the fact is, if, if a Bible teacher, someone who would teach them correctly the Word of God, would get up in front of them and teach them from 8 o'clock till 6 o'clock, they wouldn't be fasting. They couldn't run out of there fast enough. The first damn or hell that they heard from the, the person's mouth, they would just run out the door and go eat at Shoney's and think they were right in it and say, oh, that person said, how can he be a pastor and talk like that? Because he was teaching the truth just as Jesus taught the truth. So Jesus said to them, now he's about to ask them a question. They asked a question, now he's going to ask them a question. Can the wedding guest mourn while the bridegroom is with them? The answer to that is no, and they knew that from their culture. Remember from the culture that when, the, uh, when you went to have a wedding, uh, that the, uh, the bride or the bridegroom, the guy, would have to arrange the wedding feast. And it was always the guy who would have to pay the dowry, and then he would have to pay for the party. So the guy would go and pay the father for the daughter, and then after he paid the father for the daughter, he would go and pay for a lavish party. And they would drink wine, and sometimes they would get drunk, which isn't right, but they would do it, and they would have a big party, and most people would have a blast. And he would furnish all of that, pay for all of it. And they didn't go on a honeymoon right away. And during this party, they had to stay there and entertain the guests. So they don't mourn. You see, they, what Jesus is saying to them is, look, you're always mourning. And you think that because you don't eat and because you mourn and because you self-sacrifice and because you're into asceticism, which is giving up something that you think is important, and when you do that, you think you're so great and so holy. And then he goes, I say to you, how can the, the, the bridegroom's host, how can the bridegroom's guest, how can they mourn while the bridegroom is present? Who's the bridegroom? Well, he's making an analogy to himself. Jesus Christ as the bridegroom to those who believe in him. So he's saying, look, I'm on the earth. These people can't mourn while I'm on the earth. I'm not going to ask these people to go into asceticism while I'm on the earth. I'm not going to ask these people to give up the normal functions of life while I'm on the earth. He's saying to them, look, legalism doesn't work. You think you're holy because of who and what you are, and you're not. And that's what he's telling them. So Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn? No, they can't. They have a blast. A lot of them have a drunken blast. Can the wedding guests mourn while the bridegroom is with them? No. And then he goes on to tell them this. The day will come when the bridegroom is taken away. The day will come when Jesus Christ has to go through the uh, burial and resurrection. The day will come when he has to go through, when he has to be hung on a cross. And during those days they will mourn. And during those days they will fast. Well, they won't even want to eat. Not when they see their Lord and Savior hanging on a cross because they didn't understand why he was. They didn't understand that was the means of salvation. Just yet, they knew that he would save them. They just didn't know exactly how. So when they saw all of that, they became very, very depressed. They saw their teacher with whom they had been on the earth with and following for at least three years, and they saw their teacher on a cross. It made them feel bad. Their teacher was dying. And they felt lost. They didn't know what to do. And a lot of them lost their appetite. They got so tore up about it. And, and Peter especially got tore up about it because he denied Christ three times. And then when he realized that he had denied Christ three times, he went on a guilt trip. And his stomach got all tore up. And there's no way he could eat or drink after something so traumatic as that happened. 
because the, the Christ told him, look, the, crocs, the cock is going to crow three times and then uh, you will know that you've betrayed me. And it happened just the way the Lord said it and then he fell all apart and went into emotional revolt of the soul and felt very guilty for what he had done. He couldn't eat then. So later on, they would fast. Uh, but during this time, there's no need for them to fast. And that's what our Lord is uh, saying to these self-righteous hypocrites. These people who think they know how to live the spiritual life better than anyone else. And they think they're holier than anyone else. In fact, they think they're holier than Jesus Christ himself. And they're suffering from a blind arrogance. So the day will come when the bridegroom is taken away. That refers to the death, the burial, and eventual resurrection of Christ. And then they will fast. Now, if we were to take this from its actual meaning, and then they will fast, this is a reference to the communion table. And we know that, uh, well, we must have communion pretty soon. Probably this Sunday we should get it ready, and this time I'll have the message ready and all of that. So uh, I don't know. And, and then after this Sunday we should really uh, get uh, strict with this and have it on the second week of every month. But we've been lax with it, and that it's my fault. I've been lax with it. All I have to do is say, let's have communion, and we'll have it. But uh, I get sidetracked sometimes, and, and but we need to get, uh, I need to make sure that we get straighter with this. Not you, I do. And then uh, we'll have the grape juice and all of that. And, and so this is a reference to the communion table. And then they will uh, have communion after all of these things occur. And then in 9.16, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment because the unshrunk patch, that is the legalism of fasting. They're talking about fasting. And it's a legalistic thing. So no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment because the unshrunk patch will pull away from the garment. That's legalism. Legalism tears away from the spiritual way of life. Legalism always tears away from it. And that tear can be very painful for the people involved. You see, what happens is... Um, well, this is the way it's described, actually. Uh, you have a pair of clothing... And they didn't have jeans then, but let's say you have a pair of jeans. They get a tear in them. That tear is a, analogous to sin. Then you put a patch on it. Well, what, what kind of patch did the legalist put on it? The legalism of fasting. So they would try to show... A, 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 an unshrunk patch means it hasn't been shrunk up yet, and it's going to when they wash the clothes or whatever they did back then. So it would be a, a big patch starting out and they would say, all right, what you need to do is fast. And they would sew it on and that would be fasting, sewing on the patch onto the uh, cut part of the jean. And the cut part would be analogous to sin. And then when you wash the clothes, that patch shrinks quickly. The other clothes have been washed several times so they don't shrink anymore. But that patch shrinks so fast it rips the uh, strands away and tears an opening. So you're not forgiven on that basis. You can't live your spiritual life on the basis of legalism. You can't live your spiritual life and say, I've messed up so now I fast. I've messed up so now I do this and do that. And that's what it's saying. You can't put, you can't put an unshrunk cloth on an old garment because the unshrunk pat, patch, that is the legalism of fasting, will pull away from the garment. And so what you need to do is live the Christian way of life. And, what they, and then it goes on to say, and the tear will be worse. You try to solve your sins by legalism. You try to solve your sins by fasting. You try to solve your sins by feeling sorry for them. You put an unshrunk patch on your jeans and it's going to rip away and it's going to look uglier than it ever looked before. Because you've just piled sin upon sin. And what is the solution to sin for us as believers? 
It is faith alone in Christ. It is to name your sins to God, not faith alone in Christ alone. My mind just to slip there for a minute. It's just to name your sins to God as a believer. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Then it goes on in 917. And no one pours new wine. New wine refers to the spiritual life. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Now in those days, they dealt with wine a little differently. And they had wineskins. And if uh, someone were drinking wine and they had the, the, the old wine, they would have a wineskin for wine and they would pour it in there and it would be sealed up and they would sell it just as they sell wine bottles. But once you poured it out and once that thing dried up, if you were to pour new wine in it, it would burst open. It couldn't hold it anymore. It would dry up. And it did not have the capability to hold new wine. So what it's saying here is, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. This is legalism based on the Mosaic Law. That's what it's referring to. So you have a new, you have a, 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 a wineskin. And you don't pour new wine, the spiritual life, into the Mosaic Law. In other words, you don't go by covenant theology. In other words, you don't go by the legalism of the Mosaic Law. If you do, you have the shell of an old wineskin. And when you start to pour these new things in there and you try to mix it up, it bursts. They're antithetical. It doesn't work. So you don't live the spiritual life based on the Mosaic Law. And that is the, the first time this has been introduced, saying the spiritual life is greater than the Mosaic Law. So we, in fact, have the new wine of the church age. That is the spiritual life. That's the new wine. And we don't pour our spiritual life into covenant theology. In other words, we don't try to live like the Israelites. We don't try to live under the law of Moses. You try to pour the new wine of the unique spiritual life into the law of Moses and you try to do both, they're antithetical. It'll burst open and pour out. We're not under the law. So legalism always tears away from the Christian way of life. And so what we have today... The reason why Christ is bringing this out, it's almost like foreshadowing. And no one pours new wine into the old wineskins. What he's saying is, we have far greater than anything that they had in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the old wineskins. And you don't pour new wine into old wineskins. You don't try to, uh, you don't try to jive the spiritual life with the Mosaic Law. And you don't say to yourself, the Mosaic Law tells me I cannot eat pork. Yet the spiritual life tells me I can eat anything, and it does. We'll see that in Colossians. And we'll see, in fact, where Peter actually gets in an argument with God Almighty. And he says, no, the law tells me I can't eat thus and so. And then God says, no, you can eat whatever you want. He gets in an argument with the Lord, a true argument. And that's because of his lack of understanding of this. If he had been listening, if he had been spirit-filled, which would have been made available, but he rejected. He didn't reject it, he neglected it. I mean, if he would have known the importance of it, he would have asked for the filling of God the Holy Spirit right then. And Peter never really rejected it. He just, sometimes he just neglected it and didn't see the importance of it. And he, it, it's not that he was negative toward doctrine. He just sometimes he just neglected it. And Jesus would say, hey, look, you need to ask for the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus would say that and his mind would probably be wandering somewhere else. And so he would uh, think to him, he, he wouldn't even be thinking about what the Lord was saying. So he never got around to asking for the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he didn't get straightened out until later in life. But that's the way most of us go anyway. And so it's just all grace anyway. So if you're not with it now, well, maybe you'll get with it later. So instead, they put new wine. Now, let me go over this. I don't remember if I did. Otherwise, the skins will burst and the wine will pour out and the skins will be destroyed. If you try to pour the unique spiritual life into the Mosaic Law, the skins will be destroyed. 
And you can't live under covenant theology. And most people around this area and around the country try to live under covenant theology. And what they are doing is pouring new wine into old wine skins. The old wine skin, the Mosaic law. And they're trying to take these new things that our Lord is presenting here and pour it into old wine skins. And they burst. And they're destroyed. And legalism destroys the spiritual life. The old wineskin is a, a reference to legalism, not necessarily a reference to the Mosaic Law, because remember, all of those people right then and right there lived under the Mosaic Law. And there was nothing wrong right then with living under the Mosaic Law. But they distorted the Mosaic Law into legalism. Legalism is the old wine skin, is what he's saying. He's not saying the Mosaic Law is the old wine skin. It is for us in the church age. And, and this is a minute distinction, but one that must be made because I must rightly divide the word of truth. They lived in a different time right now, and they still functioned under the Mosaic Law. In fact, our Lord was there fulfilling the Mosaic Law. But what he's saying is, you've taken the Mosaic Law, and you've turned it into legalism. You took the Mosaic Law, you added to it. You took the Mosaic Law and you made fasting part of it. Fasting was never part of the Mosaic Law, but now they're walking around saying, I'm holy because I don't eat. No, uh, fasting was a result of positive volition, not the means, and they confused means and result. And the means of fasting is they're so interested in the Word of God, they listen to it all day long from a person who can teach it all day long. I could not. But whoever was there then could. And our Lord definitely could. And he would teach it all day long. And as a result, sometimes they would have to fast because uh, they might miss a point. If they were to leave and go get lunch and come back, well, they might miss something. So they didn't want to. So they fasted. But they weren't great for not eating. They were great because of their interest in the Word of God. But these people distorted that and said, we're great for not eating. No, they weren't. No more than many people are great because of the things they abstain from today simply out of taboo. So it was a taboo of the day. And he is teaching against the taboo of the day. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the skins will burst and the wine will pour out and the skins will be destroyed. Instead, they put new wine, the spiritual life, into the new wine skins. What are the new wine skins? This is the protocol spiritual life for us. It was the protocol spiritual life for them. Now, the protocol spiritual life for the disciples was different for us. I'll acknowledge that. They were still under the Mosaic Law, but in fact they were under a new type. They were under Jesus' teaching. And Jesus was teaching a lot of things that they'll need in the tribulation. And in uh, chapters 5 through chapter 7, he was teaching the Millennium Manifesto. And that is what they needed to know for the Millennium. Because he was offering to them the Millennium right then. But he knew they would reject it, so he went ahead and taught what's going to happen in the tribulation as well. He covered the whole gamut for the Jews. And the millennium is for the Jews because in the millennium, the, uh, the client nation will be Israel. It's for Gentiles as well. Gentiles will be there and living the same spiritual life that the Jews do. But the Jews then, it will be a Jewish age because they will be a Jewish client nation. And the tribulation is a Jewish age because it's Daniel's 70th week. And I got criticized on that point, not by any of you here, but by other people on the internet who thought they knew more about it than I did, and they didn't. It is part of it. That's why the church age is separated. I've taught you before dispensations in which the church age was completely separated from Israel. And that's why we can't look around the world today and see all the things that are happening and say the tribulation must be right around the corner. Well, it might be. And the, and the resurrection could occur now and the tribulation then would occur tomorrow. And the great tribulation would occur three and a half years from tomorrow. But, but what I'm telling you is that's a Jewish age. We're in the church age. It's separated. We have something phenomenal. And then the tribulation is separated from us. 
completely and totally separated because it's Jewish. We're Gentiles. They're Jews. It's separated. Now that's not to say there won't be Gentile believers. There will be. But that doesn't change the fact that it resumes the age of the Jews. And this is where this uh, fellow got hung up because he kept saying, look, there's going to be Gentile believers. How can you say it's the age of the Jews? Well, during the age of Israel, when there was Moses, well, there were Gentiles among the Jews. Very few, but they were there and they were believers. And there's always been a few Gentiles among the Jews during their age who believed. Just as today, while most believers are Gentiles, there are a few Jews who have believed. It just switched roles. We switched roles so we have a whole new age called the church age. And so now most of the believers are Gentiles with very few Jews. Before then they were all Jews with very few Gentiles. And so the ages have been separated that way. And we separate the tribulation from the millennium, but both are still Jewish ages. I mean, and there's going to be a client nation. And you can't say that uh, the Jews having a client nation is not part of the age of the Jews. It is. They're the rulership. Now, we'll be there as, uh, as saints ruling as well with Christ, but the Jews will have special blessings then as a client nation. And we have sp special blessing now as a client nation, but we're a Gentile client nation, not a Jewish one. And Israel over there, while they're an honorable country, they're not a client nation. Most of them are unbelievers. Only a very uh, small portion, if not 0.1% in Israel, are believers. So no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the skins will burst and the wine will pour out and the skins will be destroyed. Instead, they put new wine, the spiritual life, into new wineskins, the protocol spiritual life for us. And both are preserved. So if you put the spiritual life into new wineskins, they are preserved. Now for us, that means we must have the unique spiritual life of all time and pour it into the new wineskin. The old wineskin would be the let me put it to you this way. During the times of the Jews, the old wineskin would be a salvation by works. That's an old wineskin. That's how they thought they could get into heaven. And they would pour old wine, which would be salvation by works, into old wineskin. And then when they heard the gospel, they found out that it's a faith alone in Christ alone, no works attached to it. But they wanted to hold on to that old wineskin and they wanted to say, I want to hang on to those human works. I want to hang on to those things that I used to do as an unbeliever. I want to hang on to uh, salvation by works. So they would try to pour in this uh, new spiritual life into those preconceived ideas and it would burst open and spill all over the ground. That's not how you live your spiritual life. That was the point Jesus was getting across at these legalists. Now we have to the Jewish rulers in 918. As he was saying these things, the ruler. Now this ruler is of the synagogue of Capernaum named Jairus, or Jairus, however you want to pronounce it, J-A-I-R-U-S. Now this is also found in Luke 8, 40 through 56 and Mark 5, 21 through 43. As he was saying these things, the ruler, and he is the ruler of the synagogue at Capernaum named Jairus. He came and he bowed low before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Now this was an indication that Jairus of the synagogue of Capernaum had the faith rest drill. And he had already believed in Christ, but now he's believing that Christ can uh, heal his daughter. And he can. He's the Son of God. Of course he can. Now Capernaum, I'm going to tell you a bit about Capernaum. Not much right now. Maybe a bit more later. Capernaum is an area of extraordinary negative volition. No one there cares for the Lord. No one there cares for the gospel. No one there cares for doctrine. They're steeped in legalism and they're steeped in religion. It's a very religious area. And the fact that this man came from the synagogue shows that it's a religious area. 
And it was a place where there were a lot of synagogues. And it was a place where there were a lot of Pharisees. And they hated our Lord. And they're going to hate him even more because he's going to make his presence known there. So Jesus and his disciples got up and followed him. And the point to make out of this is that his disciples are still following him. Remember last night, the insults our Lord just slung all around at the disciples. It was for their benefit, and they finally realized that. And so instead of forsaking our Lord, they got up and followed him. Because they knew they needed the butt-chewing that they got. So they got up, and they followed our Lord. And then in 920, but a woman who had been suffering with this is actually from the Greek, with some kind of hemophilia. We don't know exactly what, but she was a bleeding. And, and uh, I know about from where she was bleeding, but I won't tell you about that. But a woman who had been suffering with some kind of hemophilia for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. Now, this was an indication of faith that Christ could heal her. However, she did limit that healing. You see, uh, in her own mind, she said, Christ will only heal me if I touch his cloak. And she thought there was something mystical and fantastic about Christ's cloak. She limited that in her own mind. That's not true. Christ could have healed her if she had just said, Christ, heal me. But she thought, in her own mind, if I just touch his coat, I'll be healed. For she kept saying to herself, if I only touch his coat, that's what a cloak is, if I only touch his cloak, I will receive healing. So she limited in her own mind the method by which Jesus Christ could heal. Christ was not himself limited in this manner. And Christ was not limited to simply healing her by her touching his coat. She thought that way in her mind. And she was still using the faith rest drill, but she was just a, enough confused to think to herself, if I just touch his coat. Well, she knew he was the Son of God, and she thought, well, maybe it might radiate through his coat. But uh, she would have been healed if she'd have just stand up and said, Lord, heal me. Or if she'd have just thought it in her mind, he would have turned around, as we see he's about to do, and heal her anyway. But when Jesus suddenly turned and saw her, he said, you see, there's no indication she even touched his cloak or his coat. He just uh, suddenly sees her. So when Jesus uh, suddenly turned, he suddenly turned because uh, he knew she was behind him. So he suddenly turned around, looked at her, saw her and said, Daughter, have confidence. Your faith rest has healed you. He made it very clear to her, look, just because you touch my cloak, you think that's the source of your healing? It is not. Your faith rests drill. You've been using the post-salvation spiritual life of the Old Testament, and she was using it then. And that's the faith rest drill. And that was the ultimate of the Old Testament uh, life, of the spiritual life, was to have the faith rest drill. She had the faith rest drill. So he just turns around, looks at her, and says, Look! You've had, you, you're using the faith rest drill. So that is what has healed you, not my coat. It wasn't my coat, it was your faith rest drill. So what he's doing here is establishing precedence for one thing and one thing only. And that is, every problem that we face in life is solved by our utilization of the, the problem-solving devices that we have. She had the faith rest drill. That's all she had. That's all they did have back then. Today we have the ten problem-solving devices. So what Christ is telling us is, look... Every problem that comes into your life can be solved by the ten problem-solving devices, the two power options, the three spiritual skills, the four spiritual mechanics. These things will solve your problems. Not my cloak! Not some miracle! And we all look for miracles when times get rough. And God can perform a miracle just like this from His omniscience, and oftentimes He does. And sometimes we see miracles. But we have far greater than miracles, and that is our unique spiritual life. And we can be going through some terrible, terrible times, but we can utilize problem-solving devices and get through them and grow up spiritually. 
If we could ask God for a miracle every time something went wrong in our lives, we'd never grow up. Never. We would never be able to test out the faith rest drill. We'd never be able to test out grace and doctrinal orientation because as soon as a hardship come along, we just kneel down on our knees and say, God, take this away from me. And from a miracle, he would do so. And sometimes it does occur for our benefit, but sometimes it doesn't. In those times when that doesn't occur, we need to be ready to use the 10 problem-solving devices. Now, I'm not denying that miracles don't happen. They do, and it's easy for God to perform a miracle. But we need to learn how to live a spiritual life so that when things aren't going our way, we can apply doctrine. Why else would we have doctrine? Why else would we have to sit here day after day to learn something if we didn't have to apply it? We do. And sometimes, once you grow up enough, it, it gets a little fun. And you say, oh, this, here's another test. Let's have fun with it. I got the doctrine to handle it. Let's go with it. But then when we get to evidence testing, of course, that's no fun. And it hurts very bad, very, very bad. But we have to have the doctrine to deal with it. So, but when Jesus suddenly turned and saw her, he said, Daughter, have confidence. Your faith has healed you. Now, it wasn't her faith in Christ. She had already believed in Christ long before this. This was her faith rest drill. She was using the faith rest drill. She saw, she saw Jesus Christ and said, He is the Son of God. He can heal me. He can do anything. He's the Son of God. That was her faith rest. And at one point, she got confused and thought, well, if I just touch his cloak, his coat, I'll be saved. But uh, Jesus actually compliments her and says, it's not my coat. It's your faith rest that has healed you. In other words, the problem-solving device that I have given you healed you. So he's setting a pre precedence by saying, problem-solving devices solve problems, not miracles and not his cloak. And the woman was healed then and there. Then in 9.23, when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the funeral, the flute players, and the professional mourners wailing. Now this shows a superficiality of culture. Back in Israel, they had professional mourners. They would actually hire people who would weep and wail around the deceased corpse. It's really a grotesque type of uh, situation. But they would hire these people. And sometimes, all of us, you may not, but I definitely knew people who would make a big deal out of funerals. And they would turn a funeral into their own self-pity party. Well, they would... Uh, they had a lot of approbation lust in their life, which is approval lust. And the only reason they went to a funeral, they weren't even concerned with the dead person. They just wanted to go to the funeral so that people would pat them on the back. And they would weep and wail. And, and they really didn't care that much about the person, even though they may have been close to that person. It was more uh, to get the attention of those around them. And it was the same in the culture of Israel because, look, they hire professional mourners. And they would play the flute and play mournful songs, and then professional mourners would come up and make a, a fool of themselves for the money. That's what they did. And we've known people who do the same thing in our culture. We don't have professional mourners. But I'm sure if you've been on this earth long enough, I'm sure you've met someone who can really make a scene at a funeral. Now, I'm not talking about any of you. I have went to some. Your funerals were a couth and, 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 and nobody went nuts. But I've been at funerals when you know, some of my relatives, in fact, just acted nutso and just fell all apart. Oh, <laughs> fall out in the floor. All a show, though. It was all a show. Well, this is the way it was then, and they would hire people to put on a show. And so it shows superficiality. Now then, Jesus comes to this uh, funeral. Now, Jesus is not one for superficiality. If you've been uh, uh, listening for any time at all, you know that Jesus, uh, if anything, it, it, if he had an old sin nature, he would get very mad at this, or at least it would turn his stomach. And he would say, oh man, look at these idiots. 
but he didn't do that. But what he did was uh, show his authority, because in 924, your Bibles might say he said, get out once. No, he didn't say it once. He, he walked in there, and, and here's the professional mourners acting all crazy, and here's the flute players, and here are people putting on a big show when they don't really care. They just want attention for themselves. And he walks in in verse, chapter 9, verse 24, and he says, Get out! Get out! Get out! Well, he had to wake their, he had to get their attention because you have to understand it was a noisy situation. The flute players are there. And then all the other people there. So he walks in there. Get out! Get out! Get out! Over and over again. And was powerful about it. I mean, he just, well, he's, uh, he's going, he had to do that to break all that emotional nonsense. And then he goes on to say, because the girl is not dead. She's just sleeping. Now just think, look, look, go ahead and read ahead and see what they're about to do to him. What were they doing before that? They were crying. They were wailing. They were moaning. They were having a big self-pity party. Oh, the person's dead. Wah, 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 whoa. But now what do they do when Jesus walks in and has some authority and says, Get out! <laughs> look what they do. They start to ridicule him and start to laugh. They've just been wailing. This shows their superficiality. They go from crying to laughing just like this. Dunk! In one second. And they see our Lord walk in and tell them to get out, that she's only sleeping, and they go from wah to ha <laughs> That guy's nuts! In one second. It shows that they are superficial. They went from Mourning to ridicule. Now, anyone who is truly mourning, and I'm not saying that you can't truly mourn for someone, but anyone who is truly mourning pays no attention to anything going on around them. Anyone who is truly mourn, anyone who is truly devastated and is uh, totally falling all apart and uh, crying and laying down, they would have never even recognized the Lord walking in there. They wouldn't have. They'd have been too tore up. And they would have been truly weeping. These people weren't truly weeping. The guy they're weeping for, or the girl, must have been a total jerk. Because they don't even, uh, all of a sudden, they acknowledge Jesus and they laugh at him and ridicule him. <laughs> this guy says she's not dead. <laughs> well, they were just crying a second ago. And then in 925, when he had thrown them out, this was our Lord Jesus Christ, demonstrate you see in Capernaum they had strong negative volition and they had such a strong negative volition apparently they even lost their natural inclination to be sad when someone passes away they had to hire people to cry for them they were disgusting type people and they were negative to the Word of God and what did our Lord do with those negative people he threw them out now, we don't know if he did it physically or verbally. Probably verbally, because our Lord was tough enough verbally to get them out of there. And he had been saying, get out, get out, get out. Well, probably when they didn't leave and they kept ridiculing him, he probably got right in their face. This indicates that he was a strong man. He wasn't any type of uh, a skinny fellow that you see in drawings. He was a strong man. He had to be all the exercise that he was getting walking around. A very tough man. And he got up and he probably kept telling them, Get out! Get out! And he might have even shoved them a little bit. Get out of here! He had something to do. He was the Son of God and he was on a mission. So when he had thrown them out, he threw them out. And this demonstrates his authority. He went in alone now. Everybody had just uh, concluded this man psychotic. We'll leave him alone. <laughs> so he went in and took her by the hand, and the little girl got up. So he healed her, and she got up. What happened to all that ridicule then, people? They had been ridiculing him, and they and who needed the ridicule was them. And they had to fake a mourning situation. They had to fake the fact that they uh, cried and they had to hire professional mourners. 
They had no sympathy in their own hearts. And so he took, he went in and took her by the hand and the little girl got up in 926. And then the news of this spread throughout that region. The news spread throughout that region because superficial people are impressed with miracles. They weren't impressed with grace. And I'm sure Jesus Christ had in the past, for all the times he had been to Capernaum, he had taught them grace. They weren't impressed with grace. What were they impressed with? Miracles. So they see a miracle and now they're impressed. You can imagine the frustration of our Lord, if he had any. Uh, frustration sometimes borders on, on sin. You can have a certain amount of it that uh, is normal in life, but if it, you let it take over and you uh, let it uh, overflow your soul, then you fall under the sin nature. So our Lord never did that. But you can imagine how frustrated he was. Well, this is how he knew they were so negative. Because now... He had been so tough with authority, teaching grace. Now that he uh, performs a miracle, the news spread about him throughout the region. Superficial people impressed with miracles. The same today. Superficial people impressed with Benny Hinn. And he might really be performing miracles, but it's from the power of Satan and the demon world, not from the power of God. Those things are gone now. No one has, no believer has the power of miracles anymore. And remember, miracles were given to the apostles. They got the gift of miracles to exemplify our Lord, not themselves. But what do they do? They bring in money for themselves. They heal people and make themselves feel good. They don't exemplify our Lord. I've never even heard one give the gospel. Not one of them. Have I ever heard, give the gospel? They just say, in the name of Jesus, you're healed. And they take attention to themselves and they fill up stadiums in Charlotte and Atlanta, wherever they go. Fill them up to overflowing. It's a condemnation of this nation. Just as this is a condemnation of Israel, impressed with miracles. Well, we too, as a nation, not us here, but as a nation, we seem to be impressed with miracles. And when you see that, they'll fill up a stadium, a whole football stadium of nitwits, most of them unbelievers, some of them believers who have no sense. It's a condemnation of our nation because of what should be uh, filling up the stadiums is the word of God, but it doesn't. But the fact is, uh, the Word of God never really has filled up a stadium, ever. The, the closest we've probably ever come to that was with the Apostle Paul, and that's because it was a time of great positive volition, and a lot of people around the Apostle Paul wanted to listen to him, and he had throngs of people following him. But since that day, it's been very sparse, very far and few between. So if you're expecting that uh, we might have a large church, uh, well, stop dreaming. It's not going to happen. But it doesn't matter as long as we grow in grace because our impact can be awesome. Our impact from learning the Word of God can be awesome. It doesn't take a lot. And we might dream of having... Well, shoot, who, who wouldn't want the whole world to go positive toward doctrine? It's a natural feeling, but it's not... Uh, it's not going to happen. Maybe some disaster might wake some people up, but probably not. This country will probably go under without anybody. Uh, they would still reject it, probably. Now, I don't know the plan of God, the will of God, and I don't know everyone's volition around here. It would be presumptuous for me to say so. But maybe someday some disaster will occur and people will start to take an interest and start to walk in. But I tell you what I pray every night or almost every night. And that is that if there's anyone in the area who wishes to hear the gospel, that they will make their way here so it can be presented to them, or they'll, ma or they'll get it in some other way. It's not, I don't make the issue me, I just make the issue, hey, if they want it, it's here, or they can get it uh, by whatever means you want them to get it, Father, and that's the way I say it. And then I say if they're interested in the Word of God and they want to learn the infallible Word of God, they can get it here. And if they want to come, they can walk in at any time. 
And you can direct him them here, Lord. And the fact that it hasn't happened says to me that there's not much positive volition. But a disaster might happen tomorrow, we don't know, maybe in a week from now, maybe a whole ten years from now. But a disaster might happen, and I might go into prayer the night after the disaster, and then floods of people start to go through the door. Yes, it could happen. But it would have to do with the, well, now they're, they're, they've woke up. Now all the weeds of the details of life aren't strangling them because they've lost everything. I watched a movie the other night. It's an old movie from the 80s, and it was about nuclear disaster. And people lost everything in the movie. And people went nuts. And there was a church there, much like this one, about the same size as this one. And uh, only a few, and they, at first, uh, well, they were showing up late. One guy was riding with his girlfriend on his BMW, and they showed up late, and they were waiting from it for him. And the pastor looked a bit disgusted and said, all right, is everybody ready now? And then they walked in and had service. Then after the whole disaster happened, every one of those people showed up on time the next time they had church. Now, the pastor in the movie didn't have much sense, but uh, it doesn't matter. The, the issue is, when disaster happens, people start to look for answers, just like they did on 9-11. And yesterday, I looked on the computer at some of the images from 9-11, and I do that occasionally because I don't ever want to forget it. And when I see those people jumping from those buildings, and you hear them splat on the ground... And when you see the disaster of, uh, well, what was punishment? It was a punishment for us. Just think about it. What was it? Eighteen people, if that, brought the whole United States to a close. They closed down our airports. Most people were so tore up they couldn't even work, me included. I didn't even want to work that day. And my boss was such an idiot, uh, she thought that we should still sit there and keep on working. Until finally some guy walked in and said, Look, lady, our country's under attack. Give them a break. But she was, I guess that was her way of handling it to try to keep things normal where she was in charge of everything. But I kept working there till 5 o'clock. But it tore me up to see that that day. And every time I see it after that day, I get tore up because I know it can be seven times worse. You see, the second time it happens, it's going to be seven times worse. That is, if it's going to be part of the cycles of discipline. We might have a few little things happen here and there. Well, that wouldn't be part of the cycles of discipline. But if we get something seven times worse than uh, what happened on 9-11, then we know the cycles of discipline are in play. And they very well could be. And the fact that it hasn't happened means that there's just enough people who have listened to the Word of God so that uh, God has hold, hold, he's held back the storm clouds of the five cycles of discipline. How long he's going to do that, I don't know. But there better be a turnaround. And so we are no different than the people in Israel that we've been studying. We would treat the Lord no different. And we might say to ourselves, oh no, I would follow the Lord everywhere if, everywhere if he were here. Well, how do you gauge that? Your attitude with doctrine. That's how you gauge it. Where, where are you, everybody? No, I'm not talking about you specifically. I'm talking about everyone in this city. And they, a lot of people in this city, 90% of them probably say they're believers. And I say to you, where? I say to them, where are you? Where are you when it comes to the Word of God? You think going and nodding to God on Sunday impresses God? You think that walking into a church where they don't even know the gospel message impresses God? You think that giving 10% of your measly income impresses God? They do. And they're just like the Israelites, thinking that fasting impresses God. And they think that what they do by going to church on Sunday and going to prayer meeting on Wednesday impresses God, and God is not impressed. He's disgusted, and he's about to vomit them out of his mouth, even though they are believers. That's what it says in Revelation. And when, they are, and when the believers of this country are vomited out of the mouth of the Lord due to negative volition, that means the fifth cycle of discipline. And you might say, well, it's not going to happen. Yes, it is. All of us here are young enough, if we live a normal life, to see it happen. 
And we got to wake up to the importance of these things because uh, I saw what happened on 9-11. And we might be forgetting it. But there were a lot of people before 9-11, I would tell them these things. The young people I would hang around back when I was 18, 19, and 20. And I would walk up to them and I would say, look, maybe you need to get with the Word of God because uh, our country, it looks like it's about to go under. And they would ridicule me and laugh at me just as they did here with the Lord. And they would say, United States, we're the most powerful country in the world. That'll never happen. Then when it happened on 9-11 and our country was immobilized, I didn't hear from them. They were too humiliated. And a lot of people thought that nothing like that could ever happen to us. Well, nothing like that could ever happen to us if we were getting with the Word of God. But it did happen, and it will happen seven times worse if we don't straighten out. So when he had thrown them out, this exemplifies his ability to demonstrate his authority. He went in, took her by the hand, and the little girl got up. And the news spread throughout the region because they were all impressed with a miracle. Now we're going to go to the blind. This is the ministry of our Lord to the blind. He didn't have much of a ministry in Capernaum so far. Uh, most people ridiculed him and laughed at him. And they joked about him, yet he was still very tough. And you have to be tough. If he would have been soft, they would have overrun him. If he would have said, get out of my way, folks. I'll save the man. Get out of my way. They would have, they would have pushed him back. But he didn't do like that. He said, get out! And was tough. And it was the only way to get their attention. And to the blind, he says this, As Jesus went on from there, two blind men started to follow him and shouted to him repeatedly, Son of David, mercy! And you might see Son of David have mercy, but this is, in, this is they leave out the verb because they were shouting at our Lord. And no one shouts at our Lord except demon-possessed people and people who know that they're in the right. So he says, Son of David, mercy! And this is an aorist imperative in which in their confidence in who and what Jesus was, they were demanding mercy from him. They were demanding. They were demanding mercy from the Lord. Mercy, Son of David! And these blind men had a handicap they couldn't see, yet they became a witness against every unbeliever in Capernaum because all the other unbelievers in Capernaum had eyesight. All the other unbelievers in Capernaum, a lot of them had great wealth and they were under a lot of religion. And so this, these two blind men coming out of nowhere and knowing that he was the Son of God showed faith, the faith that, that no one else had in Capernaum. So when he went into the house, the blind men came to him. You see, they were still following. Our Lord hadn't answered them yet. And he just keeps on walking and walks into a house. And they're still following him. And Jesus said to them, You see, he finally got them to a place. They didn't know it. They were blind. But he finally got them to a place where there were a lot of bystanders standing by. And there were a lot of people from Capernaum who were negative toward the word standing all around. And so, finally, he looks at these blind people in order to uh, humiliate the bystanders or for the benefit of the bystanders, really. Do you believe that I am able to do this? He looked at the blind people standing there. He says, do you believe that I am able to do this? Do what? Make them see is what he's saying. Do you believe I'm able to do this? And they say, yes, Lord. But they don't say it once. They say it repeatedly. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. They're excited because they know they're about to be able to see and they believe it. So then in 929, then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, your faith rest drill, Become healed. So the prerequisite for their healing was their use of the faith rest drill, which again exemplifies the fact and sets precedence for the fact that our problem-solving devices lie in the, well, our problem, uh, the, the solutions to our problems lie in the problem-solving devices. And that is the solution to their problem, not being able to see the faith rest drill. 
and they believed that Jesus Christ as the Son of God could make them see, so they saw, and they were able to see. Now in 9.30, and their eyes were open, but Jesus commanded them sternly. He made it very clear, and he made a stern commandment. And when it was stern, it means he raised his voice a little, and he made it known to them that uh, he didn't want anyone to know that this had occurred. So he said, make sure that no one knows. They had just been given eyesight. Why in the world would the Lord tell someone who has just been given eyesight not to tell anyone about it? Well, it's very simple. They were so emotional they wouldn't be able to give the gospel straight to start with. And they still, even though they used the faith rest drill, they obviously still didn't know enough about the gospel to go around and preach it, especially to a bunch of negative people. All the people there were religious. So for their benefit, not for his benefit, not for Jesus' benefit, but for the benefit of the blind folks who can now see, he's saying, don't you dare say a word. If you say a word, you'll be persecuted is what he's telling them. But he didn't tell them what would occur. He just said, don't do it. Don't go out there and say a word. If they would, and they do, as we see, they're going to receive persecution. And we'll see this in 931. And we'll see from 934 and 930. There's a link between 934 and 931. And we'll see that in a moment before we close. 9.31. But they went out and spread the news about him throughout that entire region. But they disobeyed the Lord. The Lord was very stern and said, Make sure no one knows. But they went out and spread the news about him throughout the entire region. They were so emotional that they disobeyed the Lord. So do not be led by your emotions. It's a principle we can get for this. And if we follow our emotions and disobey the Lord and we try to live a spiritual life based on our emotions rather than living our spiritual life based on the Word of God, we will fail. If we say to ourselves, well, I feel I must do this, yet you're in conflict with the Word of God, you're living off your emotions just as these new believers were who had a little bit of the faith rest drill and they failed because they were new believers and they only knew a little bit of the faith rest drill. Whether they went on later, we don't know. The scripture is silent about that. But they got emotional. Who wouldn't? They can see. If you were blind your whole life or for however long and suddenly you could see, you would get emotional, and that's what they did. And they ignored the command of our Lord. They probably didn't even hear him. You see what happens when we get emotional? We shut off our ears. We don't listen anymore. And when we get emotional, whether it be through anger or whether it be through a happy emotion, when we get too emotional, we don't listen. And they got very emotional. You see, their eyes were opened, and then Jesus said, Make sure no one knows. They didn't even... They didn't hear our Lord say that. Well, they may have heard it, but it was blocked out by their emotions. They were so excited. And so they directly disobeyed the Lord. But the Lord told them not to do that because he didn't want them to face criticism. Because Capernaum was a place of negative volition. And there were a bunch of legalists there, a bunch of religious people. And he didn't want them to go out and confuse the issue because he knew that only he could handle those religious people. He knew that only he, with his toughness, could get up and really rip them to shreds until they realized they needed a Savior. These people didn't understand that because they would run through the cities and say, I see, I see, and I couldn't see before, and I went to this man called Jesus Christ, and he let me see. I think you should believe in him, and they would run through the cities and say that, which would be correct. But then they would look at these blind men and say, his power is from Beelzebub, which would be Satan. And they would look at them as servants of Satan, not as servants of our Lord. So they ended up uh, receiving some undue punishment from the legalists. All this comes out in the Greek. You don't see it in the English. And we'll see that from the but in 934, that these are two conjunctions. But is a conjunction. But is used in 931, and but is used in 934. And it's showing a link here. It's showing a link between the fact, well, 931, but they went out. They did it anyway. And then in 934, but the Pharisees said. 
So if there's a link there between 931 and 934 showing that the reason, it, what it's actually showing is they were persecuted. Those blind men were persecuted because they went into an area that was negative, tried to preach the gospel without knowing enough about it, and so what happened was they received ridicule. As they were leaving in 932, a man who could not talk and was demon-possessed was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the man who had been mute spoke. Now there are certain types of demon possession that carry along with it certain types of abnormal diseases, certain types of unexplainable diseases. And somebody will get demon possessed, they can't speak anymore. Someone will get demon possessed, lose their hearing, lose their sight, lose something, and then become very violent and very, uh, well, very strong as the demon has uh, possessed them. And a lot of times in these healing meetings that you might see on television, the demon will enter someone. And they might enter someone who has been mute at a Benny Hinn meeting. Maybe they can't speak. Well, what happens is the demon enters that person, and they've been in that person for a while, and they have inhibited their ability to speak. So they go to a healing service with Benny Hinn, and Benny Hinn, having the ability in contact with the demon world, can say out, and the demon will go out, and then they can speak. Therefore, a true miracle has just occurred, and it has. It's a miracle. He just pushed out a demon. And the, uh, now some healers are just completely phony and there are others who actually can perform these things because of their contact with the demon world and you say that sounds funny and ridiculous and not possible remember Saul who went to see the witch of Endor she had an ability to contact the demon world and be possessed by an Engostromuthos demon it does occur and why would Satan want to show a healing all over television to distract believers from the spiritual life. Because all of a sudden, uh, you are distracted and you say, I want a miracle. I have something horrible going on in my life. I want a miracle. And instead of using the problem-solving devices, you hop out and look for a miracle. You've just jumped into the cosmic system. So that's why these things occur. And that's why you see all of this insanity on television. Because these people are in the cosmic system. They don't know it. It's sad. They still walk around thinking they're holy. They still walk around. Some of them aren't even saved, but they walk around calling themselves Christians. And it's sad. I'm not saying it's not sad. And I'm not saying it's not a terrible thing that has happened. And I'm not ridiculing them. They've just been sucked in to a system, the cosmic system. And when you get sucked in that deep, it's going to take a lot to get you out. And it's been very rarely that holy rollers have gotten with the word. Yet it has happened. I've known of a few cases from, or my pastor as from his messages told me of a few cases. I've never personally witnessed someone go from holy roller to positive. Because usually you look at them and say they're a lost cause. Yet sometimes it has happened from grace of course. Then in 933, after the demon was cast out, the man who had been mute spoke. And the crowds were amazed and said, Never has anything like this been seen in Israel. Well, what, when the crowds started saying this, the crowds of Capernaum, the legalistic crowd started saying this, the uh, Pharisees, the teachers, their teachers. You have to remember, they've been the ones in instruction over them for a long time. And their teachers started to say to themselves, oh, this man's about to take away my flock. This man's about to take away my living. We can't let this happen. So they got a bit scared. So what the Pharisees did, they immediately came up with an answer. And it would be, a legitimate answer, really, especially today. But it wasn't the case with Jesus Christ. But they thought, well, they said, but the Pharisees said. Now, this but is a conjunction. Why did I shout but? Because in 934 it says but. And then in 931 there's the conjunction but. 
You see, he told them, don't you go out and tell anyone about this. And then it goes on to say, but they did. And then here, uh, Jesus Christ has healed these people. And then it comes out and it says, but. He didn't want them to go out and tell the religious people what had happened because he knew they would be saying, but. But. Uh, oh, Jesus Christ did that, but it's from Satan. And so th these two conjunctions of but line up exactly right. I, I might not be describing it to you in the best manner, uh, but what I'm trying to tell you is these two, think these two conjunctions line up with each other. But they went out and spread the news. They shouldn't have because everyone was negative. And then we have but. Well, this shows that everyone was negative. First of all, they weren't negative when they rejected our Lord in that. They were positive believers. And when they just went out and did it anyway, they were so excited, well, they made a mistake. So their but resulted in this but. That's what it's saying. But the Pharisees said, he cast out demons by the prince of demons. They were jealous of our Lord, and they decided to say, look, you think he's so great? Ah, he's under the control of Beelzebub. And they'll later say that. And we will see that Beelzebub actually means, well, it's talking about Satan. It's a title for Satan. But uh, it was a way for the Jews when they said Beelzebub, what they were really saying is Prince of Dung. That is how they described Satan. Prince of Dung. You know what Dung is, human excrement. The Prince of Dung. And so they were saying that Jesus Christ was the prince, was under the control of the prince of excrement. So what we see here before we close up, I just want to tell you this much, is that uh, there's a lot of negative volition in Capernaum. Our Lord had to be very tough with them and really rip them to shreds whenever he could, yet they still ridiculed him. And even though after they saw all of those things, they rationalized what they saw and said, this man is uh, the prince of, uh, this man is operating under the prince of Beelzebub. And so what we have here is a bunch of people who were excited and wanting to give the gospel, who, and they were told by Jesus not to do so because that area was negative. And Jesus did not want them to face all of the harsh reality when you have to face great negative volition. It would be as if they were uh, running around Anderson saying, I've been healed. You can imagine, after our Lord had been hanging out with prostitutes and everything else, you can imagine what the religious people would say. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things that we have noted. May he make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. And Father, we pray for our president that you will continue to give him wisdom in this war against terrorism. And if it be your will, may you continue to hold back the storm clouds of these cycles of discipline so that we can continue to grow in grace and in knowledge under the principle of freedom. And remember um, uh, Joseph, or remember Isaac, who later became Yisrael. In the same case, remember those who are growing in grace and will one day make it so as to be a, uh, a uh, point in which they can, uh, from their spiritual lives, hold back the coming fifth cycle of discipline. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.